One Sabbath he was going through the cornfields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abathia was high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. So these two controversial scenes, one in the grain fields and one in the synagogue, are very important for us in understanding kind of the direction of Mark's gospel today. And the story begins with Jesus' disciples literally making a way through some fields. And what concerns the Pharisees is the fact that they are traveling and gleaning on the Sabbath. And to the Pharisees, this equates to working, okay, and therefore deliberately neglects the mandate to observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. Okay, they're concerned with kind of a status of keeping it holy, keeping it right, doing it properly. But as we've heard, Jesus disagrees here, not because he regards the Sabbath commandment as trivial, but because he does, regards the Sabbath in a different light. And that's what we're exploring. How does he do that? Well, Jesus, first of all, turns to another piece of scripture, a story about David. And in that story, as we heard, David was a fugitive uh, with his allies and he was fleeing Saul. So at this point in the Old Testament, Saul had declared his intention to kill uh, and, and, and chase David. So David and his friends enter the house of God and in need of food, they eat some bread. And Jesus argues that the priest did nothing wrong in breaking the strict letter of the law concerning the bread. This is the moment where he broke those laws. Because by remedying David's hunger, the priest, and here we are, sustained the life of a traveler and secondly, contributed to David's quest to live out his calling to be the anointed one to replace Saul. And Jesus contends that sometimes certain uh, demands of the law are rightly set aside in favor of pursuing greater values and meeting greater needs, especially when those greater needs promote a person's well-being uh, or facilitate the arrival of a divine blessing, because that's what happened for David. And so the proper function of the Sabbath is to promote life and extol God as liberator. And everyone actually knew that back then, including the Pharisees. You see, the Pharisees actually understood the Sabbath. And what Jesus was explaining to them was nothing new. The real issue that the Pharisees have with Jesus is the assumption that somehow he and his calling are comparable to David and David's calling. Now we're reaching the nub of the situation. And by declaring himself as Lord or, or master of a Sabbath itself, it was kind of tantamount to claiming that the law's ultimate purpose is to serve him, to serve Jesus. So you can understand now why the Pharisees are getting riled up. Because as we know, Jesus' kingdom is one where the poor are fed and the slaves are set free. And so the Pharisees are offended by Jesus' vision of a new kingdom where these things happen. They're offended. And then the scene then switches over to the synagogue and the conflict over Jesus' authority intensifies. Now, for the Pharisees, the issue wasn't whether Jesus has a power to heal a man's hand or not. Okay, again, they're being very legal and they're concerned about whether doing so on the Sabbath demonstrates a disregard for God's law. It's about doing things you know, properly. And this time, Jesus responds directly, not through a story, and he says, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or kill? He's quoting from 
Deuteronomy. And then what he does is he proceeds to uh, orchestrate the man's healing, kind of illustrating the bringing of life into this man's situation, because he's not actually breaking a law at this point. So Jesus is saying the chief objective of the law, and he's showing them, uh, is to save and preserve life. And again, the Pharisees wouldn't have been surprised by this teaching. Because the idea of saving life, overruling the Sabbath, was consistent with ancient rabbinic tradition. So he knew all this stuff anyway. So what's their problem? The problem is that they disagree with what Jesus is saying about the values of the kingdom superseding their legality and laws. Now, the man was not dying, but his hand was withered. And Jesus' determination to heal, which he does, illuminates the urgency of his life-giving work, his life-sustaining work. As Mark says in chapter 115, the reign of God is near, and so people are experiencing healing and liberation. You see, with the restoration of his hand, and please catch this, the man is not just being healed physically. He's probably also receiving back his ability to work in the Galilean economy. And receiving back that ability to work, the man also recovers his ability to provide for his family. And so what's going on is much greater, much more than than simply just a physical healing. In other words, we need to avoid seeing the miracle in an ableist vein as an act of merely fixing something that has gone wrong with the man. In another miracle, the disciples say to Jesus, you know, who was it that this man had sinned, that he was blind, and Jesus had to say, it's not about that. See, Jesus in his miracles is pointing towards what the kingdom is about. It's about restoring people's lives and restoring them back to their communities. Jesus' intervention uh, represents a restoration of wholeness and dignity. It means to promote life and human flourishing. And this healing is a foretaste of what the resurrection will usher in, because Sabbath points to true shalom, peace and freedom in all aspects of life. If we truly want people to experience rest and freedom in God, it may involve or often involves the removal of things uh, like hunger, poverty, worry in people's lives. And in these two instances, Jesus seeks to demonstrate what the kingdom of God is all about. It's about redemption. Again, about feeding the hungry and restoring dignity. And just in closing, there's one other thing these two accounts demonstrate, and that's the hardness of heart of those who ought to know better. We're talking about the Pharaoh-like heart that regards law and order as more valuable than removing suffering and disadvantage before the sun sets. And yet Jesus, like the God who instituted the Sabbath, is committed to preserving life. His ministry will expose the oppressive and corrosive tyrannies of fear, a religious hypocrisy that we can sometimes suffer wherever they reside and often in our hearts. It is such insensitivity and brokenness are what move Jesus to intervene. How are we moved? How is God calling you to intervene in the world around you? Do do our hearts beat to the rhythm of the Pharisees who seek to uphold laws and doing things right, proper? Or do our hearts beat to the sound and rhythm of the kingdom? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, a word that brings comfort, guidance, but Lord, a word that also convicts and challenges us where our hearts can sometimes grow hard. Lord, I thank you for this passage today, where you illuminated your heart for the kingdom, where true Sabbath is not just about stopping uh, and doing the right thing, following laws and rules, but Lord, true Sabbath is about finding freedom, rest and peace in you. And Lord, where we recognize and see those around us who do not have that sense of peace or freedom Lord, would you, by your spirit, move us into action, Lord, that we might be your hands and feet in declaring the good news, yes, of your kingdom in people's lives. We thank you, Lord, 
once again for speaking to us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.